Jewish um, indigenous people of this land um, and to um, thank the Coastal Salish people for allowing me to be here and to speak from my um, experience um, as a mixed native Mayan woman um, from Guatemala, so um, honoring the Coastal Salish. Um, so just to kind of outline my discussion today, um, the question posed were big, big questions that I think, um, you know, it's, with these sort of questions, I think it's important for us to continuously revisit those questions um, as sort of developments occur in the movement locally, um, nationally, and on an international scale. And, and it's important to trace sort of how developments are forming, especially as, um, you know, kind of given the moment things accelerate pretty quickly. And I think uh, the time to step back and sort of assess and reflect is key to, to being strategic as we move forward. Um, so the questions were, how can we analyze the public eruption of recent struggles beginning in the Middle East and spreading ac across the globe? Um, what does this moment mean? What are people indignant about? And is this a moment of both cultural transformation as well as political upheaval? Just, you know, small questions. <laughs> um, so I tried my best to sort of speak to those and, um, you know, what I'm excited to hear from George and also from everyone else in the room around sort of these questions as we think about them together. Um, so I'm going to describe a bit of context um, of sort of crises that led to this particular context and the conditions in which these uprisings are occurring. Um, and then from there sort of discuss the Occupy movement within that larger context um, and its manifestation in Oakland in particular um, and how um, the way that Occupy Open played out was a reflection of kind of this context and how it continues today and where it can go um, is also, I think, uh, in connection to that context. Um, so in thinking about crisis and, you know, crisis not necessarily as just a one-time spontaneous thing, but crisis as like a longer term um, phase, you could say, um, it's, it's in crisis that the inherent injustice and inequality and destructive nature of capitalism begins to steadily reveal itself um, to more and more communities. And as it manifests across the social, political, and economic spheres of our communities and the larger society. So it's, it's, it's in crisis that more and more people representing sort of different identities are understanding the different ways that this system is, uh, has, a, has a negative impact on our lives, right? Um, and so the creation and expansion of capitalism has been a constant crisis, um, particularly in the hearts and minds of colonized and enslaved communities like mine. Um, again, like I mentioned, my ancestors are of Guatemalan descent. Um, and so as it expands by exploiting our lands, our resources, our bodies, and our minds, um, we struggle every day to reconcile the simultaneous resistance and dependence to this monstrous system. So crisis is sort of an ongoing uh, reality, I think, for colonized peoples. Um, and so I think, you know, when you know, talk about sort of post-colonial stress disorder that is constant <laughs> in, the, in the hearts and minds of the people in my community. Um, so I begin from this point of reference to highlight that this moment is part of a long legacy of resisting this system um, and of the constant battle between those who seek to oppress and exploit for their own benefit and those who are oppressed and exploited. Um, and so the, wet, the methods by which oppressed people resist this system depends upon the particular conditions and historical context uh, within which they're waging that struggle. And from there, you sort of start to see the demands and the vision um, stem from an understanding of this context, right? So I think the more we understand our situation, the clearer we can be about our demands and sort of our vision, right? Um, so what are the particular conditions that have sort of set the stage for the global uprisings against austerity, um, repressive state regimes, and state policies that seek to exploit more and more? Um, I, I think, but it's characterized by a crisis in three main areas. There's a crisis of economy, there's a crisis of ecology, and there's a crisis of empire or imperialism that is happening simultaneously and in connection to each other. So um, 
the con and the connection between all those crises is, is the continued exploitation and oppression of people and resources, right? So in looking at the crisis of economy or capitalism, the one it, step, it begins with the one percent's quest for super profits, um, which has led to increasing worker exploitation. So this is via the slashing of worker rights protections in the United States um, and across the globe. Um, this, so things like livable wages being also slashed and reduced, um, people their hours being cut, sort of uh, independent contractor work. So this shift to um, reducing uh, workers' capacity to live off of one wage, um, offshoring, um, slashing pens pensions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so the this has had a huge impact on the working class, right? And the other ways that the one percent is is uh, contributing to this crisis in economy is by the privatization of the common good and destructive speculation of the market on the market. So speculation where the one percent is essentially making huge bets on which market or industry will boom next, um, and then setting those markets up for failure so they can move on to the next one. So you know it was the dot com boom in the nineties the bubble burst, um, and then the housing market in the United States in the late 2000s, and that bubble, as we've all seen, has burst and had a huge impact um, across the United States, and in Oakland especially. Oakland actually has one of the highest rates of foreclosure um, homes in the country. Um, and so, you know, the rumor, I, I've heard rumors here and there, the, you know, the next market, the reason why the um, sort of superpowers are into this carbon training ideas, that's kind of the next bubble they want to inflate and then burst, so we'll see what happens. Um, so the impact, this has a huge impact on um, workers, right? We have high rates of unemployment um, as jobs continually go to um, other areas where they can exploit workers with, with more freedom. Um, and the current unof official unemployment rate in the United States is at 9.7%, um, which equals about 14.9 million people without work. And in our definition of unemployment, it's important to note that it's defined by people who are actively looking for work, so that doesn't count all the people who've just kind of stopped or, you know, and that, that how that's defined is also um, kind of problematic and leaves out a lot of people. Um, so all that to say that the numbers are actually probably much larger. Um, and when you're counting under uh, underemployed and long-term unemployed people, the rate is 16.8% or 25 million people. Um, and then if we kind of move those numbers into, okay, communities of color who are most impacted by these crises, um, if we look at African, uh, African American unemployment is nearly double what it is for white unemployment. So it's 16% versus 9%. And 42% um, of African American youth cannot find work in the United States, almost half. Um, so the other impact um, when we're looking at sort of this speculation piece is the foreclosure crisis, right? So there's been 6.6 .6 million foreclosures since 2007. So that's 6.6 .6 million homes that have kicked out, or that are empty and have kicked out 6.6 .6 million families, um, and which is an, an alarming number considering the number of people in our country and the number of people who are homeless and sort of the, you know, the what that the implications of that are. Um, and so nearly one in, and also nearly one in four homeowners owe more than what their home is worth these days. So 25% of Americans owe more money than what their homes are actually worth. So it's a setup for massive debt, right? So people are indignant. <laughs> you are pissed off, you know? Who would it be? Um, so um, that's sort of the crisis of economy that's going on in the United States today. Um, so if we move over to sort of how that connects to the crisis of ecology, the same quest Right, for super profits um, over the last 250 years has led to the current ecological crisis um, as the raw materials, land, and other natural resources needed for the production of consumable commodities are being exploited and damaged at an, at an accelerating rate 
um, to produce more commodities, right? The overproduction is, is key to this system. Um, so basic resources like water are also being privatized to be exploited as commodities, commodities themselves. So what impact does this have for our communities as we're seeing, um, you know, the climate crisis is, is real and is something that, um, you know, you can't deny and that different, it's affecting different communities um, faster than others. So if you look at, um, it's usually th um, third world peoples and the global south who feel that impact most, right? So there's the Pacific, different Pacific Island nations who are facing literal extinction because their lands are about to be um, destroyed by um, rising sea levels, you know, um, and so sort of different manifestations of climate crisis occurring in communities of color is also uh, a sign of the ecological crisis. Um, and so how does this quest for, how does this eco ecological crisis connect to the crisis of empire? So in order to ensure the sort of free and cheap access to not only natural resources needed for production, like oil, minerals, and gases, um, but also to ensure their access to labor markets, to the land, and to the international markets to sell the goods that they're producing. Um, developed countries have increased their economic and military power to ensure this access, right? So empire and imperialism is about ensuring access to these different things and um, ensuring that the, the maximum amount of profit can be made on a global scale. Um, so resistance to this kind of economic or military control has been constant. And so the US is increasingly relying on its military to try and force its will on others. Um, as, we, as, as we've seen with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, Iraq being the longest US war in, this, um, in the last you know, 100 and so years, um, and the funding of military regimes all over the world. Okay, so, thank you. Um, so it becomes consistently clear that the deepest impact um, that these different crises uh, will have are on um, people of color around the world, third world peoples, people of color, are the first to feel this and to sort of as I mentioned in the beginning, like deal with the internal, interpersonal, and institutional formations of these crises. Um, excuse me. And so, um, as these crises are converging, um, so must um, and it are the people um, resisting around the world and sort of convert, trying to converge the resistance in really in response to this converging crisis that we see happening. Um, so, for example, in Egypt, um, the anniversary is coming up in a, in a couple weeks, January 25th, the initial call was against um, the state's repressive regime um, via police brutality. Um, and the, and as, the, as, the, as the movement, the revolution developed, um, it's larger, it became more apparent that its larger implication was against US imperialism. Um, as Egypt is the number two receiver of US military aid. Um, and so as the 18 days evolved, the demands named the regime's policies as also contributing to the economic crisis in the country as well. Um, and so, you know, fast forward to September when Occupy began. Um, it was also, an, it, it, that developed um, as an attack on the, Primarily on the economic crisis that was happening. So in Egypt, it was like a crisis, also economic crisis, but sort of led to speaking on um, the crisis of empire. And when Occupy began, it was an attack primarily on this economic crisis and the impact it's been having on um, communities all over the U.S. And it has evolved to address also the ecological, ec ecological and imperial crises um, in some formation. It could be, you know, solidarity, solidarity actions. It was um, via, you know, doing, um, allowing for space in different occupies to articulate and assess these different crises and the role that occupies could play in, for example, when um, in Egypt the, rep the repression was surmounting and so should we do solidarity marches. Um, and, you know, as the tar sands actions were happening, what role could occupy play in connection to that? So trying to articulate um, the 
place that Occupy could hold to um, speak to these different crises in a simultaneous way. Um, <clears throat> so I, when it first began though, I personally wasn't imagining it would grow to the level that it did. Um, because it wasn't being led by those most impacted and affected by these crises, right? Um, so the people who've been doing, the communities of color across the United States, um, or the organizers across the country that have also been working on these different issues in communities most impacted um, by these crises for a long time. Um, but then it continued to grow, so I was like, okay, this is, this is moving, this is moving, and it was bringing along um, the sort of uh, grassroots organizations that have limitations on the sort of creativity they can in tactics um, because of the sort of infrastructure that they have um, and the way and the sort of um, careful attention that needs to be placed on how uh, tactics are used given the targeting and criminalization already of communities of color, so there's sort of a limitation on militancy. So what Occupy did was kind of opened up this space um, to push us in that direction. Um, and so, you know, it was a mass invitation for the 99% to step forward and challenge systemic economic inequality as a sort of unified front. Um, so Occupy made space for um, uh, taking up public space in, a, in the literal sense and reclaiming the idea that the commons can organize themselves into a space of collective responsibility and collective action. And so um, the space to converge, the, the literal plazas and the squares, is central to the kind of mobilization and growth of the mass movements across the globe, um, you know, as exemplified powerfully by um, the role that Tahir Square played in, in the revolution in Egypt, for example. Um, and so that mass commitment and character and unified vision is key in the development of a movement that can fundamentally challenge the 1%'s interests, um, where they're forced to really concede to our demands, right? So unifying demands and vision is, is central. Um, so the question to kind of ask ourselves now as we try to sustain the momentum and build on the opportunity that Occupy opened up for people in the United States is where and how do we continue to converge across sectors, across political cultures, um, identities, and communities to articulate a shared vision forward that addresses these crises um, that we're fighting on various different fronts, right? Big question. So where, where do we converge sort of post-eviction, post-raid, um, at least in Oakland and, and other parts of the United States? Um, so I think the question, the question that follows that is, are we committed to working that out together in the most literal and figurative sense? Because working together is not, you know, it's not enough to have the desire to work, to be committed to a particular cause and you know, to work with your fellow neighbor, there's, um, you know, it takes a considerable amount of infrastructure, of coordination, of also unpacking sort of different um, uh, uh, understandings of your own sort of position in the world and how that relates to who you're working with. Um, and so what we had in Oakland were organizers and organizations that had that capacity um, to try to facilitate this sort of working together process that's difficult. Um, and uh, so they, you know, were contributing to this opportunity to build movement that Occupy had opened up in that sort of way. And so some of those organizations were mass-based organizations that were focusing on issues faced by working class communities of color. So um, one organization is Casa Justa Just Cause, which works on, um, which works with families who are facing foreclosure, um, tenant rights issues, and also immigrant rights issues. Um, so, and connects the three. Um, we had um, critical resistance, which is fighting the prison industrial complex, complex and working on issues of police brutality. Um, there was the o Oscar Grant Organizing Committee. Um, so Oscar Grant was murdered on January 1st of 2010 by a BART police officer, and it was videotaped. He was shot point blank. And so since then, there's been um, an organizing committee trying to address issues of police brutality in Oakland. 
Um, and so you had these sort of organizations along with local unions like the International Longshoremen, um, the Oakland Teachers Association, the California Nurses Association, the United Health Workers, and so and other unions representing different um, different sectors, um, kind of rising to the occasion to push Occupy forward in the way that they could because of their capacity, because of the sort of role that they play um, and the way that they're structured. So these and many other formations um, along with those that Occupy Oakland greatly contributed to the sort of mass success that was the November 2nd um, general strike. I would say that in quotations um, because uh, it wasn't technically a general strike because there were, there were still people working it. So that sort of thing. But the, you know, the, the fact that we had 50,000 people walk to the port and were able to shut down the port that day and had a sustained, sustained action from 8 in the morning until midnight, um, a large part of that success was due to this sort of uh, concerted effort to work together in this way and um, validate the contributions that sort of each uh, space could offer to the larger sort of movement goals, right? Um, so Occupy Open make, made this sort of more militant call to action and opened up the space for organizations um, with the capacity to organize um, to rise to the occasion. So um, the Occupy Oakland camp has definitely had its challenges in being a space that was truly inclusive and, inclusive and representative of people of color. And that's a predictable challenge, right, given that the lack of there's a lack of race consciousness that develops in a country with a history of white supremacy, colonialism, genocide, slavery, right? That's an ongoing sort of work process consciousness that we have to take on if we're really serious about working together. Um, but, you know, so despite those challenges, it's important to acknowledge that those attempts of reshaping the comments from diverse political traditions and cultures has tried to account for this fact and uphold the priority of collaboration and working together with community organizations that have done the work to, to build the collective power of particular sections of the 99%, right? So there's working class people of color, there's the urban poor, and I think we've, um, it's important to sort of look at who makes up the 99% and what is the role that each of those sort of sections of the 99% play in pushing this movement forward. Um, so, um, I think this kind of working together is what allows for militant action, action to continue beyond the plaza post-rate evictions, right? So this is how Occupy o Oakland was able to shut down the port of Oakland again um, on, December on December 12th for the entire day. And there was also solidarity shutdowns all along the West Coast. Hey, Vancouver, woo! <laughs> Exciting day. Um, and that also took, co again, collaboration between organizations, um, and people that were fed up with these crises and, um, and the Occupy sort of different formations that stemmed from Occupy. So where is Occupy today? Um, the Occup or where is Occupy Oakland specifically, excuse me. Um, Occupy Oakland still meets four times a week um, for general assemblies and there's working groups that work on just different aspects of, of how they want to move the work forward. So for example, there's a foreclosure crisis committee that supports Occupy, there's now an Occupy the Homes effort that's going on in Oakland. Um, so they support that sort of, um, it's based on sort of take back the land of going to um, empty homes and um, occupying them because they're technically, you know, the of the commons. Um, and so there's a committee that's set up to sort of support that initiative and then once people are in the home, like they need water and sort of the infrastructure that goes along with that kind of work. Um, and they also support organizations that have called on Occupy Oakland to support um, their actions to protect working, you know, working class families who are facing eviction in Oakland. So, um, you know, now they're calling on Occupy Oakland to you know, on an auction day or on eviction day, go to this person's house and, and, and sort of protect them from eviction. So, um, yeah, so their work is constantly being met by attack from the city, however, um, and OPD, Oakland Police Department, has been harassing Occupy Oakland since, since its inception in October. Um, but in the past weeks, the number of 
pointless arrests and raids with no sort of rhyme or reason um, have overwhelmed occupants and it's specifically targeting African American men um, and people who watch and record open police department activity. Because the, the, the sort of logic is if we get someone um, and we can place some kind of larger, more uh, felony kind of charge on them, the assumption is that since there's African American men have a high rate of already having charges on them, because of California's three strikes law, they may be able to get some people on the third strike and put them in prison for longer sentencing. So it's a way to sort of continually criminalize African American communities um, who are tapping in and working in the Occupy movement. Um, so it's it's a very like real strategy to um, again like de to um, disempower the um, power that Occupy movement is building. Um, and so one example of that is. Um, Kali was arrested, um, he's, he was an organizer of Occupy Open for trying to reclaim his blankets when the cops were closing in and he's been held for three weeks and may face life imprisonment under California's three strikes law um, because Kali had prior felonies and now he's being accused of assaulting a police officer in jail. Um, while his uh, psych, he, he, what he has a mental condition and his psychiatric medication was being withheld from him this entire time. So um, his third strike results from his attempt to do good work in Occupy Oakland and now he could face life imprisonment. So there's dozens of other occupiers in jail currently at the moment where um, you know, the cops are really tr trying very hard to place very serious sentencings and um, send people to jail for two to four years. And this is a tactic we saw in the 70s and how they broke up the movement. It's not anything new, but um, I think we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to prepare for this very real attack by the state? Um, and so, um, in thinking forward for 2012, um, you know, I was at a meeting a few weeks ago of a, a group that, um, of kind of left organizers to kind of think about how, what this means for our work and take space to reflect and assess. And the question was, you know, looking forward to 2012, where do we see the Occupy um, work continuing to build on um, and expand? And uh, the listings were, you know, things like the G8 summit in Chicago and really working on trying to um, have a serious impact there. Um, May Day, really making May Day like a more militant kind of um, opportunity to shut down again where we can shut down. And there were other sort of um, examples in, um, of, of places where we can continue to build on this momentum. And I think what's important about that thinking forward um, is, you know, we've done actions every year. There is a mandate every year. The G8 has come before. We've done sort of actions um, that target the 1% in these different ways. But I think what's important now is it's within this context of the 99%. It's framed within this larger effort of the 99% to target the 1%. And I think um, we've struggled with thinking about a, a, a container that can hold all these different efforts as sort of a unified front against the 1%. So I think that's what's promising looking forward. And um, yeah, hopefully we can continue to build. Thank you.